Marbury was a tactical and deliberate loss in the short run in order to achieve a grand strategic victory over the course of the years. And that is making the federal courts a co-equal branch of the federal government and protecting the rule of law. And I want to say judicial review is not the only way to protect the rule of law, but it is one way and it is our way. The Burr trials, uh, this is not Jefferson's finest uh, hour. He had many not fine hours uh, in my study of constitutional history. Um, this was not his finest hour because he ordered the prosecution of Burr knowing that the evidence was very weak and knowing that there were not two witnesses to the overt act of levying war against the United States as the Constitution requires for a treason conviction. Um, Marshall was right not to interpret the treason more broadly, uh, and in particular to refusing to accept the federal prosecutor's argument that there's something which was recognized in some European states uh, of constructive treason, um, which would have been very dangerous and treason prosecutions would have become another political uh, weapon. Um, but many elites were upset with Marshall, um, uh, especially in Virginia. Uh, the Virginia Argus newspaper said that his performance in that trial showed that an independent judiciary is a very pernicious thing. And of course, Marshall's steadfast adherence to the Constitution, um, even in a treason trial against the unpopular Aaron Burr, showed just the opposite, that an independent judiciary is a very precious thing. Dartmouth. <clears throat> Dear old Dartmouth. Well, this was another Marshall miracle. The Contracts Clause to the Constitution uh, was put in by the original framers in order to protect creditors from state legislation giving relief to debtors. Marshall somehow transmuted that in the, uh, the decision transmuted that um, and turned the contract clause into a magna carta for private colleges and universities. Uh, it came to stand for the proposition that states should keep their mitts off these private institutions of higher learning. Um, it spurred the establishment of many, many more small colleges um, throughout the Northeast in particular. It spurred, I would argue, the development of women's colleges. None existed before the Dartmouth College case. Uh, within 10 years, uh, Mount Holyoke and other colleges uh, were established. Um, uh, these were vulnerable groups. There was some public hostility. They weren't admitted to public uh, schools. Um, and the Dartmouth College case, I think, gave room for otherwise um, uneducated or people without access to education to get access to education. Prior to the Dartmouth College case, there were only six Catholic colleges uh, in the country. In the next three decades, 34 more were developed. And I argue in a recent article that the Dartmouth College case laid the seed for the establishment of black colleges, colleges to educate newly freed men and newly freed women uh, immediately after the Civil War when almost the entire African-American population lived in the South. Um, and states kept their hands off these private colleges created by missionaries and the Freedmen's Bureau and they proved critical and so important to the black population during the subsequent period of Jim Crow. And of course, it was a Magna Carta not just for private colleges and universities, but um, for private corporations more generally. And this is the part of the Dartmouth College case that most people talk about. It helps spur economic development throughout the growing nation. McCulloch, um, this is perhaps the greatest opinion. Um, Marshall famously uh, said, we must remember it is a constitution we are expounding.
uh, it is meant to endure for the ages, um, and paraphrasing somewhat, uh, be available to be adapted to crises as they arise. Um, and that was announcing uh, a mode of interpretation that was uh, not tied to the original purpose, um, and perhaps not tied necessarily to the language in all respects of the Constitution. For instance, in that case, um, the holding was, one of the holdings was that Congress had the power to charter a national bank. No place in the Constitution does it give Congress that power. And it gives Congress specific powers in the Constitution to build post roads and raise armies, etc. But Marshall says Congress must be able to use any means that are needful and helpful in achieving the enumerated powers. So it's known for the, as the doctrine of implied powers. Yet, there is a clause in the Constitution, the Necessary and Proper Clause, which Marshall uh, relies on in part, which says Congress shall have all powers necessary and proper to fulfill the powers we've just enumerated. The word necessary sounds like it's a pretty strict limitation. And Marshall says, no, no, don't worry. Necessary doesn't really mean absolutely necessary. It means needful, helpful. Marshall never explains why a privately chartered bank is needful or helpful for any of these other purposes, like building post roads or raising armies. Justice Robert Jackson said it best in explaining uh, the significance of Gibbons. Uh, in a 1941 opinion on the commerce power, which Justice Jackson wrote, here's what Jackson said. At the beginning, Chief Justice Marshall described the federal commerce power with a breath never exceeded. At the beginning, uh, he's telling us that Marshall is a framer. Because after all, 1924, that's 35 years after the Constitution has been ratified. But it's at the beginning because this is the last framer. Um, and uh, Jackson there is both recognizing Marshall as a framer and recognizing his interpretive feat of FEAT, of giving Congress the tools it will need to regulate a growing economy. Um, the case had more obiter dicta even than Marbury versus Madison. Uh, uh, Marshall didn't have to tell us all about how broad the commerce power was, because in the end, he held that the New York statute giving a uh, monopoly to Fulton and Livingston was inconsistent with the federal law and had to fall under the Supremacy Clause. Um, and let me tell you one humorous aspect of this case. At one point in his opinion, Marshall says that the power to regulate commerce extends to every species of commercial intercourse among the states. The word intercourse. And this led one states rights politician to write, I shall soon expect to learn that our fornication laws are unconstitutional. The antelope. In this case, Marshall explicitly recognized that there was a conflict between the quote, sacred rights of liberty and property. Now the constitution may be described as pro-slavery but it's clearly, and even more so, pro-property. And once Marshall recognized enslaved persons as property for purposes of constitutional law and international law, the die was cast. Uh, and I don't think he had to, at least as a matter of constitutional law. The Cherokee cases. The court, the court, per Marshall in this case, managed to uh, cement or drive home uh, many or reaffirm many previous holdings. It upheld Section 25 of the Judiciary Act of 1789, which gave the Supreme Court the power to strike down state laws as unconstitutional, among other things. Um, it reaffirmed 
that only the United States government, the federal government, could deal with Indian nations. Not states couldn't, because Indian nations were sovereign. And just as only the United States may deal with Britain, only the United States may deal with the Cherokee, um, uh, which it does through treaties. It recognized that the Cherokee tribe is sovereign within its jurisdiction, within the lands recognized in these federal treaties, and said as a matter of international law that Georgia statutes had no, uh, were not binding on the Cherokee. Um, and this was what the uh, parties in the case wanted. You understand, Georgia passed this law saying white people couldn't go into Cherokee land without a state license, even if the Cherokees wanted them to. So some missionaries who uh, were invited by Cherokee onto their lands um, openly and flagrantly violated the law in order to bring a test case. And the governor of Georgia uh, tried to keep it from getting to the Supreme Court by by pardoning these missionaries after they were convicted in state court of violating the law. And so they didn't appeal because they were pardoned. But this guy, Worcester, refused the pardon. He wanted to bring the test case. He wanted the Supreme Court to do exactly what it did. It became a little complicated because at the end of the Supreme Court's opinions, it says, therefore, Georgia must release him from prison. And as Marshall knew, Georgia did no such thing. This could have been a real showdown. Was Marshall going to send federal marshals into Georgia in order to physically free uh, Worcester? And could there be um, uh, hostilities and, and deaths? Uh, as it happened, he never had to. And ironically, it was Jackson, President Jackson, who convinced the governor of Georgia, for various political reasons, to free Worcester. Um, <clears throat> of course, the Cherokee won that case, in a sense. Uh, the missionaries were really suing on their behalf, but only for a few years. By 1838, the Georgia Cherokee and most of the other uh, others are on the Trail of Tears on their way to Oklahoma. William Marbury was a would be justice of the peace. Uh, he was appointed at the tail end of the Adams administration uh, to a vacant position uh, created by Congress for the District of Columbia, one of several people appointed to be justices of the peace. Um, and Secretary of State Marshall uh, had signed his judicial commission. Uh, however, somebody failed to deliver it. Um, and uh, so he was prevented from taking office as a justice of the peace. Uh, so he was really not a key person, except that he sued. He sought a writ of mandamus from the Supreme Court requiring that the commission be delivered. Uh, so a minor character who played a major role. Because he did not have the commission, he thought and at the time, others thought um, he, the appointment had been incomplete. In fact, we know from Marbury versus Madison that um, the delivery of the commission is not required. That's part of the obiter dicta in Marbury versus Madison. Um, but at the time, it was thought that it was required that it be delivered to him and that he have it as proof of his appointment. Thomas Jefferson was facing what he understood to be a weak court, but a very smart man in John Marshall. Uh, he uh, instructed his Secretary of State, Madison, not to deliver the commission, um, thereby setting up the lawsuit to begin with. And so his position in this case was that uh, the midnight judge effort was successful in some respects, but it was not successful with respect to Marbury, and nor should it be. His new administration has taken over, and he had the power and right to decide um, 
this guy shouldn't be a justice of the peace. Chief Justice Marshall disagreed. He spends much of the opinion admonishing um, the administration, implicitly the president himself, uh, for failing to respect and um, permit the exercise of the vested rights of Marbury in his position to be justice of the peace. Oh, this op opinion, this case is um, fun but hard to teach because it is like an onion. You can peel off layer after layer. The ultimate holding in the case is narrow. The Supreme Court didn't have jurisdiction. But before getting there, uh, Marshall takes a run around many questions that uh, recur in constitutional law, such as what is the discretion of the executive? Uh, when must the executive uh, accede to uh, the rule of law, and when does the rule of law give him discretion to decide what to do? Um, uh, that's the first half of the opinion. Um, and as I say, uh, Jefferson loses that. Uh, then Marshall has to, uh, th that was all unnecessary, Marshall has to address um, whether the court can hear the case. Usually you consider that at the beginning. Um, and here he looks at Section 13 of the Judiciary Act of 1789. Um, and he notes that Marbury had sued for a writ of mandamus, as indeed uh, that section provides. Uh, but he says that uh, that section um, providing for a writ of mandamus to the Supreme Court, meaning a the Supreme Court to issue an order, ordering an executive official to do something, to wit, Madison to deliver the commission, that that grant of jurisdiction to the Supreme Court uh, went beyond what the Constitution permitted Congress to grant in the way of Supreme Court jurisdiction. Um, that is spelled out in Article Three of the Constitution. Um, and uh, Marshall says it, it doesn't include this kind of uh, writ of mandamus. Um, along the way, I think he misconstrues Section 13 of the Judiciary Act. I think he misconstrues construes Article 3. Um, but he does so ostensibly in a stance of humility. Oh, we're the Supreme Court, but we just don't have power to hear, you know, the Constitution doesn't allow Congress to give us power to hear this case. And so ultimately, we must dismiss the suit since we have no jurisdiction. Um, of course, the case is known for and is most properly famous for its recognition that the Supreme Court can hold an act of Congress unconstitutional. Here, Section 13, this portion of Section 13 of the Judiciary Act. And that was the little foundling that has grown into such a big tree. Uh, the Supreme Court strikes down acts of Congress uh, uh, now relatively frequently. It didn't strike down another act of Congress in the 19th century until the Dred Scott case on the eve of the Civil War. So this was a latent power. I think it had effect because Marshall's clear in the opinion and uh, it's referred to by other federal courts who do uh, um, address the constitutionality with the possibility of striking down acts of Congress. But the Supreme Court didn't again exercise that power until in a disastrous decision. It did so in Dred Scott. Aaron Burr was a complicated fellow, uh, but he didn't commit treason. Historians um, are not sure exactly what he was up to when he contacted the consuls for Spain and Portugal and went down to Mexico. Was he planning on taking over land? I think very unlikely. Um, he didn't have the forces to do that uh, and didn't try to raise them.
Was he planning on entering into agreements with foreign nations which would violate the Neutrality Act? Um, uh, maybe, maybe not. Uh, as I said, the evidence was very weak in that case. Uh, that's because we don't really know what the facts are. In those circumstances, one should not bring a prosecution. I think Marshall adhered to the rule of law um, adamantly and properly in this case. But and Marshall had no particular uh, approbation for Aaron Burr. However, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. By this point, Aaron Burr is an enemy of Jefferson. And Jefferson is an enemy of Marshall. We know that mostly from Jefferson's letters, not from Marshall's. Um, and so I don't think Marshall shed any tears that he had to basically order the jury to acquit Aaron Burr. Dartmouth College was founded in 1769 uh, before the Declaration of Independence. Uh, the charter for the college was given by the royal governor, the governor of the colony of New Hampshire, although Marshall, in the opinion, says it was given by George III. It was given by George III's agent, I guess. Um, and the founder of Dartmouth College was a very fascinating guy, almost as fascinating, actually, although not as important, as John Marshall. His name was Eliezer Wheelock. And he had an interest, a long-standing interest, um, in teaching Indians uh, to read and write, as well as Christianizing them. He began this effort in Connecticut at a charity school in Lebanon, Connecticut. He sought from the uh, governor of Connecticut uh, and the colonial powers a charter for the school so that it could sue and be sued, so it could borrow money. It, you don't really exist uh, unless you get uh, some sort of license or charter making you a legal entity. And he, he couldn't get it in Connecticut. Uh, in any event, the Indians in Connecticut had moved away as, as the white population grew. So uh, Eliezer Wheelock went looking for a new place to, uh, to found, pursue his interests. Uh, and he decided on New Hampshire. He went all the way up to the middle of New Hampshire uh, on the Connecticut River, across uh, on the other side of which is Vermont, what became Vermont. Um, and he liked the place, but he still needed funds. So he sent to England to raise funds for him one of the Indians whom he had educated in Connecticut, a guy named Samuel Ockham. And Ockham was apparently a very charismatic man. He went to Britain and raised lots of money, he gave many, I mean, some people say hundreds of speeches. Uh, Lord Dartmouth was one of the people he met, though it's actually not clear that Lord Dartmouth gave any money. But the group of donors in mostly England wanted the school to be named after Lord Dartmouth, hence the name Dartmouth College. Um, Wheelock may have pulled a fast one here. The donors thought that they were donating to the charity school that would be chartered in New Hampshire. Um, but Eliezer Wheelock's ambitions had grown. Uh, he saw that New Hampshire had no institution of higher learning, and he was determined to establish the first one. So they may have thought they were giving their money to Moore's Charity School. For a while, uh, the Charity School and Dartmouth College both operated, um, but the charter uh, um, was primarily to Dartmouth College, and that's where Elias Zuelak spent his money. Um, charter was given in 1769, which is given as the founding date of the college, although the first classes didn't graduate for some years. The charter provided for the education of Indian youth and others, um, uh, whites, and uh, the number of Indians available wasn't great because it was primarily an institution of higher learning. Um, and 
after some number of years, few of any Indians were uh, educated at Dartmouth. Dartmouth reaffirmed its, uh, that portion of its mission in the late 1960s. Um, and uh, there are many members of tribes who are at Dartmouth College today. Dartmouth was a sectarian school. It was Congregationalist. It was primarily preparing men for the ministry, as was true of many of the early um, colleges. Uh, and uh, in 1816, there was an election in New Hampshire where the Federalists were thrown out and a new group of people took over in the legislature and in the governor's office. Uh, the new governor, Governor Plummer, um, had been a Federalist, but was now a follower of Thomas Jefferson in matters civic and educational. And he approved of Thomas Jefferson's uh, efforts and plans to create the University of Virginia, to, to create a non-sectarian school that would prepare men for uh, the needs of the nation and the needs of the states in commerce and business and learning and law, as well as uh, the ministry. Uh, so it, Dartmouth College happened to be at a very weak time um, in, in its history. There had been a falling out between the trustees and the second president of Dartmouth, who was Eliezer Wheelock's son, John Wheelock. John Wheelock apparently did not have an attractive countenance and was autocratic. Um, and the trustees slowly took away his powers to teach, to appoint the minister in the local church, to set the curriculum. Uh, and he went to the state legislature before the election, seeking their help. Federalists weren't much interested in helping him. Uh, and when the trustees found out he had gone to the legislature to s see what they could do to help him, they fired him. So he was out of office at the end of 1815, and then miracles. The Federalists are thrown out, and this guy Plummer is governor, and so Plummer has no particular interest in, in Elias Wheelock, I mean, in John Wheelock, and having him reappointed as president, but he does have an interest in having an educational institution in the state that will um, do more than Dartmouth uh, was doing at the time. Uh, so he thought, what's the easiest way to do this? Create a new institution from scratch? No, we'll just change the nature of Dartmouth College. Um, the, he got the legislature to pass three statutes in 1816. One of them changed the name of the institution to Dartmouth University, which is why today it's still called Dartmouth College, even though it's in fact a university. Um, uh, the other pieces of legislation were more subtle. They didn't directly prescribe a curriculum. Plummer didn't want that. He wanted there to be flexibility to adapt to the ages, as Marshall did with respect to the Constitution. Um, the problem, he thought, was with the trustees. So the statute enlarged the board of trustees, created an oversight board called the Board of Visitors, and provided that the governor of New Hampshire would basically have the appointing power for all these new people. So he would appoint what today we might call progressive educators. Um, and that is the way that Dartmouth would change. Uh, it's not so different from what Massachusetts had done with respect to Harvard, and Connecticut had done with respect to Yale. Um, state officials sat on their boards. The difference is this. In the case of Yale and Harvard, the current trustees, the old trustees, accepted the legislative uh, overtures and worked with the um, legislative officials and uh, state officials uh, so they consented. Whereas at Dartmouth, the trustees, uh, or most of them, refused to consent. Uh, when uh, 
They saw this new legislation extinguishing the existence of Dartmouth College and creating Dartmouth University uh, using the very buildings and books that be had belonged to Dartmouth College, they sued. Um, who did they sue? Well, they're really suing the state of New Hampshire. But uh, there wasn't a clear writ to do that, a way to do that. Um, so they sued the treasurer of Dartmouth University, whose name was Woodward. Uh, and they sued, a, a writ, a, filed a writ of Trover to have returned to them their seal, their keys, um, basically all the instruments uh, that were the formal recognition of this institution of higher learning be returned to Dartmouth College. Who was Woodward? Woodward had been treasurer of Dartmouth College. And he, looking at the new legislation, uh, decided to cooperate. So he agreed to become treasurer of Dartmouth University. Um, one reason he may have agreed to cooperate is that one provision of the legislation passed uh, by the state legislature made it a crime to interfere with the state's takeover of Dartmouth College. Actually made it a crime. So Woodward may have been nervous about that. And when asked to, to bring the seal over to Dartmouth University across the street, he did. For a while, both institutions physically existed in Hanover, although Dartmouth University was much smaller. We do have correspondence between Plummer and Jefferson uh, about education. And uh, Thomas Jefferson certainly supported Plummer's ideas. They exchanged ideas uh, about the role of education and the role of states in uh, enabling uh, the creation of institutions of higher learning. Daniel Webster was a graduate of Dartmouth College. He was originally from Massachusetts and went back to Massachusetts. But he's a uh, valedictorian of the class of 18 ought one. And he, he went on to become a lawyer and a legislator in uh, Massachusetts. Um, he was a very good lawyer. He was not yet the famous lawyer that this case and McCulloch, also in 1819, would make him. Um, and the trustees uh, wanted to sue. It's not clear that they contacted uh, Webster before making that decision. Um, their original suit was brought in the local court for Grafton County, where I think Woodward was the county judge, as it happened, so he had to, it had to be recused. And it immediately went to the New Hampshire Supreme Court, which was then called the Supreme Court of Adjudicature. Um, Webster was not one of the people who played a key role at that stage of the case, although I think they brought him in before the case was argued in the New Hampshire court. Um, Webster really entered the case in a big way when, after Dartmouth lost in the New Hampshire court, uh, it sought a writ of error to the Supreme Court. Um, Dartmouth had Daniel Webster and other fine attorneys uh, paid them their high going rates. Its existence was at issue. The state of New Hampshire did not have fine lawyers in the Supreme Court. First of all, they had lawyers in the state court who were very good. They won the case, uh, and they made very good arguments. But the state of New Hampshire didn't want a spring to pay for them to go to Washington. So it brought in a whole new set of lawyers, led by William Wirt, who was a fine lawyer. And in fact, he had just recently been appointed Attorney General of the United States. But he's counsel for essentially the state of New Hampshire, New Hampshire ostensibly Woodward, who had the seal and all that. Uh, Wirt didn't have much time to prepare for the case. I have to understand, in this era, Briefs were not required and were not filed. 
the arguments, the oral arguments, were both the brief and the argument. Um, Dartmouth College was argued over a three-day period, McCulloch over six days or more. Um, and uh, we don't have transcripts from that era either, but we do have accounts of the arguments on both sides. And words were not good, whereas Webster's were very strong. Of course, Webster had the cat in the bag anyway, um, because we know that Justice Story had a great interest in using this case, or some case, as a vehicle for pronouncing what Story referred to as the civil rights of corporations. And um, Marshall shared that view, and these were the two strongest members of the court. The most famous line is, it is, sir, a small college, yet there are those who love it. And reputed is the right word, because as I say, we don't have transcripts. But we do have two accounts that are consistent with that. The one usually cited is the account written up in 1853, many years later, by a professor at Yale named Chauncey Goodrich. Um, as a young professor at Yale, Chauncey Goodrich, Goodrich had traveled to Washington to see the case. You see, this was important not just for Dartmouth, but for all the other colonially chartered colleges, um, which received these open-ended charters from their colonial governors or sometimes from the crown, uh, reserving no power to alter them because at the time, Parliament always had power to alter uh, um, charters. So there was no need to put in the charter subject to the government's power to alter or modify this in the following respects. Um, uh, and <coughs> uh, Marshall holds ultimately in this case that without a reserve clause like that, the state governments don't have power. To, so this was going to affect Yale and Harvard and a few other schools, um, most evidently. In any event, Goodrich was there. He took notes. Um, and many years later, when Webster died, Dartmouth planned a celebration or a eulogy uh, for him on campus. And Goodrich sent his account, rewrote, copied his account of what he had heard to uh, Professor Choate at Dartmouth, who was going to deliver the main eulogy at this memorial service. Um, and that's where we, we get the account of Webster breaking down uh, in the moment and the courtroom going silent and Marshall's tearing up. And uh, that's the, the peroration that we uh, see printed out um, or performed. But there's another account, and that is the account of Marshall himself who writes uh, about Webster's emotion and his own emotion and Webster's argument that this was the cause not only of this small uh, minor light on the horizon, but um, all the great colleges and universities and mentions Yale um, and Harvard, I believe. So I think Webster says something pretty close to uh, the account that we have from Goodrich. Marshall's opinion is often called the majority opinion. So if you look, there were six justices who were hearing the case. One dissented without explaining why. Uh, three others wrote concurring opinions, only one of whom said he was joining Marshall's opinion. So it's, but it's taken as the majority opinion in, in the case. <clears throat> and he held many things. Um, he said the question before him was whether the charter was a contract uh, and within the meaning of the contracts clause of the Constitution, which is in Article I, Section 10. That section generally puts prohibitions on states. One prohibition is that it may not enact legislation impairing the obligation of contracts.
So if the charter was a contract, then New Hampshire's laws modifying the charter by expanding the board, et cetera, changing the name, um, impaired the obligation of contract, so said Marshall. One big problem is why is the charter a contract? Marshall just announces, as he is wont to do, it is perforce obvious that it is a contract. Um, often not giving reasons for what he thinks is an obvious principle of law. That charters, corporate charters, are within the terms of a contract, of the contract clause and our contract. Um, it's a little odd because in the court's previous contract clause case, Fletcher versus Peck in 1810, um, there were the makings of a real contract. There, um, Georgia sold land that actually belonged to the Yazoo, um, sold it to developers, land developers, and the, they paid money. There was a quid pro quo, which is needed for a contract. What contracts law calls consideration. Each side gives up something in a sale or a purchase. Um, so here, Wheelock got a charter, uh, and uh, Dartmouth became, as Marshall called it, this is not a new idea, an artificial person. So it could sue and be sued and conduct business. What did New Hampshire get? It got nothing in monetary terms. Um, it did get uh, the ability to create what it, the type of educational institution it wanted. That's not what we normally think of as consideration. That just means New Hampshire did this for a public purpose. Uh, but that was a basic holding in the case. The charter is a contract not fully explained. Um, then uh, the next question was, uh, and this is not the order necessarily in which the court addressed them. Um, is this a public corporation or a private corporation? The key thing is that if it's a public corporation, uh, that means it's a, basically a state agency. And surely the state of New Hampshire has power to decide what it, its agencies should do. States have authority to create municipalities, um, and to set the terms of their existence. Uh, same with uh, chartered um, public corporations. Uh, a state might create a hospital or a state might create um, a road building uh, authority. Uh, and so is this public or is this private? And Marshall said that you can't determine, and, and this is going to be critical, because if it's private, um, then it's clear that the contracts clause is going to prohibit the state from impairing its, uh, its contracts. Um, he said, you can't tell if it's public or private by it's merely its purpose. Of course, it's a public purpose in the sense that it's a civic-minded purpose. That's the reason states give charters not only to what he called eleemosynary institutions, meaning charitable institutions, um, but also to private commercial banks and, and other commercial institutions. They, they think it's going to be good for the state. Um, rather, he said, you determine if it's public or private uh, by looking at who, who is given the rights to control it. And in this case, Eliezer Wheelock and his successors and the trustees and their successors were given the rights in the charter to control the future of the institution. Second, second point he makes, he says, he, he, these are both reasons that it's uh, private, he says. It's not clear if either one alone is enough. He says the donors um, who gave to Dartmouth uh, uh, gave private funds. Um, Dartmouth was created at the wish of the donors, and uh, their wish was to create uh, exactly what was created at Dartmouth College and nothing else. Now, Marshall actually has his facts wrong here. 
And it's not clear if the problem is um, the lack of good lawyering by the state of New Hampshire, um, or if Marshall was, uh, since we don't have a full account of the arguments, we're not sure where the factual error creeps in. But at the time that the New Hampshire colony gave the charter for Dartmouth, it also gave Dartmouth land grants, significant land grants. Um, and subsequent to the founding of Dartmouth, uh, but before the Dartmouth College case, long before, New Hampshire gave a second land grant to Dartmouth, as did Vermont. Lands in Vermont, which Dartmouth sold and used the proceeds. Um, so this Dartmouth was created with private and public funds. Um, although Marshall says it's just uh, private funds. Now, I told you that Parliament, uh, at the time of the granting of the Dartmouth Charter, had the authority to modify or repeal it, as it did all, world, all uh, British char uh, charters. Um, the revolution in 1776 meant that Parliament no longer had that power because we had now established the United States. And that power acceded to the now state of New Hampshire. So in 1776, all the way up until 1789 when the Constitution is adopted, the state of New Hampshire did have power to alter or modify Dartmouth's charter. Of course, it didn't do so then. It didn't do so until 1816. Um, but the, the Articles of Confederation, for instance, had no limitations on states' power to alter contracts. That didn't arise until a constitution was ratified in 1789. Um, and that explains uh, the, the absence of a reserve clause in this charter and the fortuitous timing of this case. Um, New Hampshire didn't act until after the constitution had been adopted. And Somehow, Marshall transmutes this contract clause, which is about no relief for debtors, into uh, not only a, a permanent charter for Dartmouth, but a Magna Carta for all private colleges and universities. I don't see the implications of the contract clause for um, the relationship between state courts and the US Supreme Court. Um, I do think that um, the Dartmouth College case reminds us that even though Marshall had the most eloquent words and established this important principle which led to growth of education and of commerce more generally in the United States, he didn't necessarily write the best legal opinion in the whole case. I think that was written by Chief Justice Richardson of the New Hampshire Supreme Court who found that Dartmouth was a public corporation, um, that in, in issuing the charter, uh, the governor of the colony of New, New Hampshire, whose power is ceded to the state of New Hampshire, essentially created a public institution. Um, at the time, private and public colleges were not well defined. In fact, I would argue that the Dartmouth College case created the distinction, which um, would not have been created had the court come out the way the well-regarded Chief Justice of New Hampshire uh, came out. The Second Bank of the United States was chartered by the US Congress in 1816, I believe. Uh, in the aftermath of the disaster of uh, the War of 1812, where um, the first bank's existence was no more because it had a charter with a time limit, and um, the United States did not have uh, easy means of borrowing money uh, and conducting itself as needed in order to prevail in that conflict. Uh, even people opposed to the First Bank agreed that the federal government needed to have um, access to funds. 
and that chartering a private bank was an appropriate way to do that. But soon after the bank was chartered, um, you know, the business cycle was then as it is now. There are ups and downs, and there was a downtime. And small business and farmers, which was pretty much everybody, uh, didn't, were not doing well and blamed it on the hated bank. Um, so at, at the time that uh, McCulloch versus Maryland is decided, the bank was the decidedly un, less popular party, uh, the party that prevailed. McCulloch was, I believe, the manager of the Baltimore branch of the bank of the Second Bank of the United States. Um, and Maryland uh, had decided to tax that bank. Other states also were taxing their branches, some, some states. Um, they didn't like the bank. Uh, if they tax the Bank of the United States, it's not going to come out of the pocket of anybody in Maryland. It's going to come out of the pocket of the federal treasury, um, ultimately through higher interest rates being charged by the bank or whatever. And uh, so didn't like the bank and needed money. Therefore, we're going to tax it. And McCulloch refused to pay the tax, uh, I believe. Um, and... Uh, Either he sued or Maryland sued him, and the case went on from there. There were two holdings in the case. The first question was whether Congress had the power to charter a national bank to create a private bank uh, to pursue its purposes. Um, the second question was uh, if Congress did have power to do that, did Maryland nonetheless have power to tax that bank? Uh, Marshall answered the first question, yes. Congress had the power to charter a bank, even though that is not listed among Congress's enumerated powers. And the answer to the second question is no. Um, and here, the answer sounds more in political science or decision theory than in law. The idea being, that if you allow a state to tax a federal instrumentality, you are allowing one part of the nation to take from everyone else. It's different from the feds um, putting a tax on state institutions, where it's all of the people acting. Um, although the feds probably can't single out state institutions of some states and not others. Um, uh, for the same reason, that that would be all the people taking from j uh, just one group. Um, they're both important decisions. Uh, the first established that the Constitution would be interpreted, at least as to Congress's powers, magnanimously, broadly, um, uh, he says it's not, we have to remember as a constitution we're expounding, it's not supposed to have the prolixity of a legal code. And so we have to take these terms and understand them in, in a way that they will endure for the ages. Um, that's important. The second principle is also very important. Uh, and uh, it's a really a, a lesson in logic and in life, um, that uh, just as no taxation without representation um, might apply uh, in, in the United States vis-a-vis -vis Britain, so also here. You can't tax the whole nation because they're not represented, the whole nation is not represented in the Maryland legislature. Fulton was the inventor of the steamboat, and Livingston was his financial backer. And New York gave, chart, gave them a charter that said they would have exclusive rights to ferry passengers uh, 
up the Hudson, down the Hudson, to ports of New York. The ultimate holding in the case was simple and narrow. Um, it was that New York's law granting this monopoly to Fulton and Livingston, who then licensed it to Ogden, um, was unconstitutional because of the supremacy clause of the Constitution. Supremacy clause, very importantly, says that federal law prevails over state law. Um, so most simply, where they are in conflict with one another, federal law has to prevail. Um, we know what the state law here was. That was the charter to Fulton and Livingston. The federal law was an obscure 1793 statute. I believe it had the word coasting in it. And it was about, I think it gave the federal government the power to really discriminate against foreign flagged ships. That was its purpose. Um, and so the federal government had the power to refuse uh, foreign flagships from landing in the United States unless they paid whatever the federal government had decided they should pay. Um, and the, without a great deal of explanation, Marshall said that was inconsistent with giving uh, Livingston and Fulton this charter. And I think technically that, that was accurate because the statute, although it was about um, favoring uh, U.S. ships, was not limited in its wording to that and could be read as saying that the federal government had the power to decide who gets to land on U.S. shores, um, including navigable waterways. That's another part of the opinion. But, um, and so if the federal government gets to decide who lands on U.S. shores, then New York can't say only uh, licensees of Fulton and Livingston can land. So that was the ultimate holding. But before he got to the ultimate holding, uh, Marshall pulled his rabbits out of the hat and uh, managed to set for all time the understanding that Congress's power to regulate commerce among the several states is nearly plenary. Uh, didn't have to say all of that, because Congress clearly had power to pass this coastings statute. Um, but that's the part of the opinion that um, was most important to him and most important in history. Obiter dicta are statements of law, uh, assertions that this statute means this, this provision of the Constitution means that. Um, this contract is no good because it's missing some important element of a contract. There are statements of law that are not necessary to the ultimate holding in the case. And it was one of Marshall's specialties to make his great pronouncements about the power of judicial review in Marbury versus Madison, for instance, about the commerce power in Gibbons versus Ogden. Um, in cases where the holding didn't actually turn on those uh, assertions of law. Um, it was a protective uh, posture that um, Marshall employed. Um, ultimately, you know, the Supreme Court uh, had no jurisdiction in Marbury, and Marbury didn't get his commission, and in that sense, Jefferson won. Um, and so the headlines might be uh, that Jefferson won. Um, as a matter of fact, a number of newspapers had just the opposite headline, um, the more accurate one, which heralded the obiter dicta that uh, the Jefferson administration had denied the vested rights of Marbury. John Marshall was the last of the founding fathers, the final framer of the Constitution. He was determined, and that is a word I would stress, determined, 
to do all he could to make the United States uh, as a republic under the rule of law to succeed. And he believed the United States would succeed only if it were one nation rather than United States. Um, and he thought it would succeed only if it were a prosperous nation, a creative nation, a nation that could undertake um, whatever measures are necessary when obstacles come in its way, um, and that could undertake new endeavors not yet imagined or thought of. And through his determination, his will, his creativity, his darn hard work, his conviviality and social capabilities with other justices and others, through those qualities, um, he succeeded. And his method of, of, I believe, his method of interpreting the Constitution uh, was with these ends in mind, a successful, unified nation to the extent he could achieve it um, that would endure. Another little thing he did that made a big difference um, was decide to the extent possible to write one opinion for the court. Uh, prior to Marshall, each justice issued his own opinion, seriatim. Uh, so Chase might agree with another justice, but gives a different reason for why he's coming out that way. One justice writes the opinion for the majority and for as many justices as possible, in fact, was Marshall's goal, as it is today many times, um, the opinion appears more powerful, more impregnable. It's more authoritative. This was a genius. A slight change in practice, I think, made a big difference. Uh, all the opinions we discussed were majority opinions. Uh, the, uh, it also helped if only one person is going to be writing the opinion and Marshall's the senior justice, as the chief justice is, he assigns most of them to himself. The court issued over a thousand, I think it's a thousand one hundred and six opinions during Marshall's years as chief justice. He wrote over half of them. He only dissented eight times. He only dissented in one constitutional case uh, in 1827. Story joined him in that descent, as did Duval. I think he would be pleased, but perhaps a little off-put, at this glorious building they're in. After all, um, during Marshall's time, they met first in a basement room of the Senate. Um, and after the British burned down the Capitol in the War of 1812, they burned it down in 1814, and, there was no place for them to meet during the uh, reconstruction of the Senate. Uh, the last thing that was reconstructed was the Supreme Court chamber in the basement. Uh, and during that period, they met in living rooms, inns. At one point, they met in some little broom closet in the basement, which one newspaper referred to as little better than a dungeon. Uh, the court was a weak institution at the beginning of Marshall. Uh, people were paying attention, certainly by 1819, two of the major cases we discussed. And Jefferson was furious at the court. He said it had turned the Constitution into, I think he said, a ball of wax. He certainly used the word wax, which the court treats as malleable, making it whatever shape it wants. We hear that echoed in modern criticisms and criticisms throughout the court's history. I think most teachers of constitutional law might answer the way I'm about to. Marbury versus Madison. He, um, he was playing a long game. Uh, and just as when one plays chess, you may think about the moves ahead, uh, but your opponent may make mistakes, may not make mistakes. What did Marshall think was going to come of this asserted power of judicial review? <laughs>
I think Marshall was right in Marbury versus Madison when he said uh, the Constitution gives the court power to hear cases or controversies. Um, when those cases or controversies involve the Constitution, it inevitably has to interpret the Constitution. The Constitution is a species of law. I don't think that's controversial. Uh, whether he was right in saying we should interpret the Constitution in this uh, flexible way or broad way so that it can be molded for exigencies of the future, um, there's dispute on that. And um, I think I, that is the direction in which I lean, but I respect people who do not lean in that direction, who say that gives the court too much power. Um, uh, if it has no anchor, or if the wording is only a partial anchor, then um, the court is not only an equal branch of government, but as to many public issues, it becomes the most important branch. Um, least dangerous in terms of uh, directly causing violence or directly taking your money. But most powerful.